morning, everyone. I started a few minutes early just so I can kind of get everyone moving in here and get everyone situated before we really kind of hit the ground running with this class and this talk on inhalation burns. I'm going to go live on like nine different things here. All right. right. So hopefully everyone's doing well and they're excited to do this class. Uh, while you are kind of just getting situated in here, I always love to find out where you guys are watching from. So go ahead, put that in the comments. Where are you guys watching this class from? I started a little bit early so we can kind of have a chat and sit down and hang out for a little bit. So um, we're not going to get started into the class for another three minutes or so. So you have a few a time to grab a coffee or water or just sit and hang out for a minute. So please feel free to let us know where you're watching from. So that way we can kind of see where everyone is kind of going first. Right on Mike. Alberta, nice. Texas, Dubai, Baltimore, Oregon. Where else are we from? Nashville, from Dubai. I love it. What about on Instagram? Where are you guys all from? London, Grand Prairie, Brunei. Luxembourg. Where else is everyone from? Scotland, India, New York City. This is amazing. I love to see everyone's locations. It's kind of, it's really cool to kind of see this, like the North Sea on a ship from offshore medic. That's super cool. Like those are the kind of things that I love to see. Like that's wild uh, that you're able to watch me teach about a, or a, a patient uh, from a shore, like offshore on a, on a ship, which is hilarious to me. Like, I think it's just amazing. So it's fantastic to see everyone. Thank you so much um, for, for joining me today. Uh, today we're going to be talking about an airway burn. Okay, a patient that has an airway burn that we need to, uh, that we need to uh, jump on very quickly. This is a patient that uh, will deteriorate very, very rapidly on you because of an impending obstruction. Uh, so Let's uh, let's kind of get into this guy and and talk about the case now. Uh, while I still have you here, uh, before we get into the case, please remember that we are uh, we do offer a service for EMT and paramedic students. And so, if you love the way that we do education, if you love how we present with patients and uh, in interactive uh, education and the the quality of the animations that we use, if you love the way that we do this and you're struggling in school or you want to continue to improve in school, you can absolutely check out Master Medics for free on a three-day trial. Check it out for yourself. If it's for you, you can um, you can stay as long as you like. And if you, if you don't like it, if it's not for you, you don't think you'll be using it, then you can cancel any time, uh, no charge at all, as long as you kind of cancel it from those first three days. And so if this is something for you, absolutely check us out. We are known for cutting study time in half uh, for students that are really uh, you know, falling behind or really struggling with some of the topics. Next thing too is that we have put together a very large continuing education platform uh, for you as well using our interactive technology, using our patient scenarios, uh, and using these cases in order to build those uh, classes. So if you love uh, this type of continuing education or if you want to get credit for this type of class, you absolutely can and you can become a Master Medics member as well. And we offer continuing education for our one, two, and continuing education only members. And you can check that out at courses mastermedics.com okay that someone was in my office okay <laughs> let's get into this case okay so I'm just gonna hit record on the there we go okay you are dispatched to a private residence for a house fire you're staging a block away when you're called in for an occupant who's burned you arrive to find the patient sitting on his truck and he appears fatigued with obvious strider with partial thickness burns to the lips, nose, as well as in the mouth and to the back of the mouth in your pharynx. Okay. This is your presentation of your patient here. Okay. So in lots of suit, you could say that there's some singed hair there or you can just note that he's very bald. <laughs> you can also notice that there is quite a bit of burns around the lips, around the nose. And so we do have um, high amounts of heat to these areas. We're going to look at the vital signs a little bit larger in a sec here, so don't worry about that. So we have quite a bit that's going on here. So based on what you see with this patient, what is your uh, primary concern for this patient? Go ahead and put that in the comments. What is your primary concern 
based on your presentation only, not just your vital signs right now, but what are the things that are going on in your head of what is your concern? What are you, what are you worried about here? Go ahead and put that in the comments. Okay, so Alex is thinking airway. I would agree with you. What else? Airway swelling from inhalation burns, shock for sure, airway. What kind of shock do burn patients typically fall under? Airway obstruction, airway collapse, internal damage from smoke, absolutely. So that's another thing to look out for. Is, it, is this patient a smoke inhalation patient as well? Something to think about as well. Okay, and there's some things that can kind of rule us in and rule us out with that. Compromised airway due to heat, possible airway compromise, hypovolemic, I agree. Uh, Patriot, I, I think that this patient or burn patients typically end up in a hypovolemic type of shock. Okay. Sepsis is more of a later on thing. That's a great thought is that these patients can fall under septic shock, but this is going to, that's going to be more of a, um, a continued treatment problem that they could have because of the high risk of an infection, but it's a great thought. Swelling to the airway due to smoke, hypovolemic, obstructive, not quite obstructive shock. Great thought, but yeah, you're low, mostly looking at hypovolemic in your initial side points. And then as this patient's getting treated in the hospital, then they'd be starting to get more concerned about sepsis and ongoing infections, which is a high risk thing when you have a significant amount of uh, burn skin that's not able to create your innate defenses for your immune system. So lots of things going on here. I agree is that your primary concern for this patient is airway compromise. Airway compromise is, is an issue here. We hear it, we can see it. Um, and so that's something that we need to address. Next thing, smoke inhalation. Is this a carbon monoxide patient? Do we need to be addressing that issue? And then third, like you said, is this patient a severely burned that we need to now uh, do a mass uh, infusion of fluids in order to assist this patient from going hypovolemic. Okay, lots of things going on here, um, but your primary concerns absolutely are your airway. You're just kind of there it is. So coming back to this airway compromise and the concerns that we have here, now keep in mind is that there are some signs that we can look for that give us an indication that this patient does have intrusion and issues within that airway. And those things are sued around the face, second degree burns, the lips and the nose, blisters in the oropharynx, so second degree burns into the back of the throat, around the uvula, those types of areas inside the airway itself, meaning that there was heat intrusion into that area, uh, burnt hair smell, and strider, okay? Those are all indications that we have an impending airway compromise that we need to address. And so those things are, are what we're worried about that are gonna tell us, okay, do we need to deal with this airway? So especially uh, blisters in the oropharynx, though that actually is giving us a telltale sign that there was heat intrusion into the back of the airway. So that's a really good sign that we have a, an impending airway. In fact, strider, which is often the most taught one, actually hadn't doesn't have a true indication of this patient needs to be intubated. It's a very good indication that we have severe swelling, uh, but there hasn't been a huge direct correlation between patients that have stridus airways and patients that don't that need to be intubated. Patients that did and did not have strider, both uh, both of those groups did need to be intubated on a pretty, pretty consistent basis between the two groups. Uh, however, when there was blisters in the oropharynx, that was a very good indicator that this patient absolutely needed some sort of airway, um, airway capture in order to keep this patient from having airway collapse. Okay, so what, what area are we actually concerned about here? What area is actually being burned? Now, when it comes to the, the airway itself, typically what we're dealing with is the, oops, sorry, is the airway in this particular area here, okay? So we're kind of getting more down into the larynx itself. That's the area that we're concerned about. And when we have the larynx itself that's gonna get inflamed, it's gonna get swollen, 
um, the epiglottis itself, or even the, the vocal cords, when they're irritated, when they're swollen, they start to not be able to open and close appropriately, making it very difficult to pass a tube through there. Um, and even before that, if we elect not to intubate this patient, what's going to happen is that swelling is going to continue to get worse. And ultimately, we're not going to have the ability to open and close the epiglottis. And we're also not going to be able to get air very well through the vocal cords in order to ventilate ourselves. And so if this patient was to, um, was to not get intubated, or if a patient like this wasn't intubated and we had a long transport time and the swelling continued to get worse, this patient's ventilatory status is going to deplete further and further and further. And ultimately oxygenation is going to get worse and worse and worse. So that's what our main concern here is with this patient. So let's look at the vital signs with this patient. Let's kind of see where they're at right now. Okay, where they're at right now, because this could be a good indicator and help us identify whether we need to intervene now or maybe in 15 minutes. So here's your vital signs. Your heart rate is 134. Your blood pressure currently 138 on 86. So map of 103, that's pretty good right now. Okay, and total CO2 is 48 and breathing rate is 32. We'll talk about that in a second. And your SpO2 is 80. 3%, 83%. Okay. So just judging by the vital signs, what are this patient's vital signs suggesting to you? Okay. Are we still thinking, yeah, this patient needs to be intubated like now, or are we thinking that we have some time? Okay. How is this patient doing right now based off the vital signs? Okay. What do you think? Go ahead and put that in the comments. They're hypoxic. What else? Okay, so I agree with you. So there's a few things that have come up in the comments and let's, let's address them. So first off, um, can we trust the SBO2? Yes and no. So here's what my thought is with the SpO2. Typically in a carbon monoxide poisoning, you're going to have an intrusion of carbon monoxide onto your red blood cells, okay? Meaning that oxygen doesn't actually read, um, it doesn't actually get a ride, hit your ride with your red blood cells on your hemoglobin. So when that occurs and you do an SpO2, your SpO2 typically is going to read um, falsely high. Okay, because what it's reading is that your hemoglobin is full, but it's full with the wrong thing. It's full with carbon monoxide. And so commonly, when you have a, carbon, a true carbon monoxide patient, you're going to have an SpO2 that is falsely high. So when you see a SpO2 that's like this, do you have to be suspect of it? Absolutely. But you can... High, you can probably think that this is a likely situation. And it's another thing that you can look at, like if you look at an SpO2 like this at 83%, be like, okay, what other things occur when a patient is hypoxic? They start to compensate for that. They start to increase their heart rate. They start to increase their systemic vascular resistance to compensate for hypoxia. Okay. Their skin goes pale. Okay. They start to get altered and fatigued. And so when you look at an SpO2 like this and be like, okay, is this a real SpO2 or is this a false SpO2 because of my concern with carbon monoxide? Look at the other signs of hypoxia, like altered level of consciousness, pale skin, fatigue, SpO2, or sorry, the heart rate going up. Those are the kind of things that you can look at to confirm your findings. So that way you're not just looking at SpO2 and be like, yeah, that's fake. There's no way that's real because of the concern of carbon monoxide. Just look at the other signs of hypoxia and that'll give you a little bit more information. So I would suggest that this saturation, especially with the presentation of the patient and the heart rate, this patient is likely hypoxic and that 83% is probably pretty close. Okay. So let's talk about the end tidal CO2. So this end tidal CO2 is interesting. So 48 as a number is not terrible. Okay, it's just slightly above normal of 45. Here's something that I would be concerned about is that breathing rate. Now, if this patient had great tidal volume per breath, would 
we expect that ETCO2 to be quite a bit lower than that? The answer is yes, because your end-tidal CO2 is controlled by a few things, but when it comes to respiratory drive and the controlling of your CO2, it's not just about how fast you're breathing, but how also how much tidal volume are you moving? Your ETCO2 is controlled by your minute volume, not just your rate. So if you have a poor minute volume, because even though you have breathing a breathing rate of 32, but you're only moving you know, a couple hundred mils of air, that's going to mean that you have a poor minute volume, which means that you're going to accumulate CO2. So yes, is the CO2 just slightly above normal? Yes, that's a good thing right now. But keep in mind that a breathing rate of 32 should drive a CO2 down. So this is a discorrelation you need to look at with thinking, okay, this patient's obviously not moving a lot of air. They have a ventilatory problem, probably due to the obstruction that's now impending. Okay. And that's probably causing your SpO2 to be down as well. So you got a few things here. Now, the next thing to look at too, when it comes to your, um, your entitled CO2, is the fact that you may have, um, you may have really, really fine like waveforms like you're seeing here. This is fine. Okay. There's no real obstructive look to it. There's no shark fin look for it to it because this airway burn. And a lot of people are asking, wouldn't we see shark fin or obstructive waveforms? Not typically because we're dealing with an airway issue. That's a little bit higher in the airway. Okay. Where the reason that we see obstructive pathology in an ETCO2 waveform is because of bronchoconstriction. Okay, and then bronco obstruction, which is lower in the airways. And so we're not, we're not there. We're not having this obstruction lower in the airways. We're having this obstruction up here, okay, in the larynx. So that's why we're not seeing a waveform that looks abnormal. Okay, so judging by these vital signs, I think we can all agree that this patient is not oxygenating very well. Okay, and for a few reasons. And another thing too, is that this patient has a, not a great ETCO2 when you bring in the whole picture of the fact that they have a uh, really high respiratory rate and they're still accumulating CO2. Okay, this means that their minute volume is poor. Okay, so this is where we're at. I got ahead of myself on my slides. Sometimes I do that. Okay. So this is where we're at. We have a poor SpO2. We have impending airway closure given the signs and symptoms. We have a truly hypoxic patient here. And I guess the question that I've been asking this entire time is, what's your priority in treatment? Is it treating the burns? Is it getting the patient on oxygen or is this getting a patient intubated as fast as possible? And I guess the next thing is, would an SGA or sub superglottic airway be a benefit to a patient like this? Let's go ahead and put those in the comments. That's going to be the first question. So I think we've answered the question of this patient's priority is airway capture. My second question, this is the one I want you to put in the comments, is would a supraglottic airway be a benefit to this patient. Would a superglottic airway be a benefit to this patient? What do you think? You could try an OPA and MBA first. I totally agree. That's totally reasonable. Let's say that that fails, which would be expected, right? Because we know where the airway burn is. And so that's kind of the issue with an, a supraglottic airway. Because if we go back to the, the anatomy of the airway, a supraglottic airway is going to sit and kind of close off the esophagus and kind of sit in this area. And then it's going to ventilate through uh, the epiglottis and kind of through the vocal cords without actually capturing the vocal cords. 
Okay. The thing is, is that the swelling is occurring at the vocal cords. Okay. And so if the vocal cords continue to swell and get so bad that they are now obstructed, an SGA is not going to be able to ventilate this patient. Okay. If the swelling was only up here, maybe, maybe you could get away with an SGA, but typically if we have the epiglottis and the vocal cords that are affected and impacted by this airway burn and SGA will fail as soon as those vocal cords swell up. So point to the point where they are no longer able to open and close and allow air to move. Okay. So the answer to this is likely not a great choice in an SGA. This patient does need definitive airway capture. Now I'm a big fan of the SGA. I like a superglottic airway. I'm really, I like those and using them. This is not the patient to use it in. Okay. This is not the patient to use it in, in typical circumstances. Okay. So there's my thoughts on a intubation of this patient. I think that it is the, the right way to go. And a lot of you guys are saying RSI. And I would agree with you that RSI is the appropriate approach for this patient. Okay, so this is the presentation of our patient. We've got them on auction. They continue to deteriorate. They're fatigued. They are still hypoxic. Okay, we're trying to prep this patient for intubation, okay, for RSI. Now, judging by the vital signs here, what are you going to use to prep this patient? Okay, so let's talk about pre-intubation first and resuscitation. Does this patient require any fluids or pressors like epinephrine or norepinephrine? What do you think? Go ahead and put that in the comments first. Does this patient require fluids or a presser prior to intubation? Brand thinking no, no fluids. Yes, presser no. Baked beans no. Fluids for sure. No. So I, I could be swayed either way on this patient. Okay. Here's my thought process with: Do I think fluids are a good choice? Yes. Okay, in order to maintain this blood pressure. Here's my thoughts on a presser. I would absolutely have one drawn up a hundred percent. Okay. A hundred percent. Would I start it be, uh, right away? Maybe. And would I be very, very cautious and be looking for signs that I need to start it as soon as I'm done intubating? Absolutely. Here's the reason why is that this heart rate here and this blood pressure being elevated the reason that we're seeing this is one, hypoxia, and two, these are compensation factors. These are sympathetic compensation factors that are kicking in because our patient is in a compensated state of shock. When we give medications, and especially when we give paralytics, what happens to sympathetic tone? What happens to our sympathetic response when we give things like a paralytic? It inhibits the sympathetic tone. And so the things that are keeping this patient from decompensating very quickly are these sympathetic factors. So my concern with this patient being is that if, if I'm giving a, if I'm doing a true RSI and doing a, a in, or I'm doing an intubation and using a paralytic and paralyzing this patient and inhibiting sympathetic tone, I'm likely going to see a drop in this heart rate. I'm going to certainly see a drop in blood pressure. And this patient may even get more hypoxic, which we know happens during that apneic phase. So would I use a presser on this patient? Possibly and probably. And if I didn't, I would absolutely have it hung and locked and ready to go. Okay, that would be my thought on using or resuscitating this patient. Fluids, for sure. Pressors, probably. 
and definitely ready if I didn't. Okay, so we've prepped this patient. We're using oxygenation to get the oxygen as up high as possible. We're throwing on a nasal cannula in order to have some apneic oxygenation while we're doing our intubation. Okay, we're making sure that oxygenation status is strong. We're making sure that the blood pressure is strong, that we're not going to have uh, post intubation hypotension or at least limit it. So we're preparing for our intubation. What medications are we going to use in order to intubate this patient? What paralytic, or sorry, what sedation and what paralytic would you use? What do you think? Fentanyl, propofol, listen on, I've never heard of that one. What are you guys thinking? What sedation would you use and what paralytic would you use? Automatate? Okay, as a paralytic, or sorry, not as a paralytic, but um, in, in comparison to ketamine. So automatate, ketamine, some are saying fentanyl, propofol if you have it, sure. But remember that propofol can cause a profound drop in blood pressure, which is not ideal in this situation. So if you are using propofol, you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to be thinking about more hypotension can occur and probably have a presser going. So you guys are mostly on the same page as me as what medication I'm going to use. And that is going to be Ketamine or Tomidate. I like to use ketamine. Ketamine is my preference. So I like to use ketamine. Uh, but a Tomidate would be an, so an appropriate choice in this situation as well. Fentanyl, absolutely. But the problem with fentanyl is that you need to compare or use it with something like Versed. You could use fentanyl, ketamine technically. Um, and But Versed would be kind of your issue is because it can cause hypotension as well. So I think if you're going to use fentanyl, um, you're likely going to be using ketamine anyways to avoid that hypotension that can occur. Okay, so I agree. Ketamine absolutely is going to be an appropriate medication. I got a little fancy with my slides. Okay, now as far as your paralytic goes, I would probably go rock for a few reasons. One of them being the fact that rock uranium just has very few contraindications, whereas succinylcholine does. Now you might be like, well, yeah, because this patient can have a potassium shift because of significant airway burns or significant burns circumference area or surface area. Uh, I would agree with you. That is uh, a definite concern, but not for a, a little while. Okay, this patient's potassium likely hasn't elevated yet. It would elevate later down the road, much like a crush injury type of patient when they have a significant shift of potassium in. That doesn't happen right away. Okay, it happens over time. And so would this, patient's, would this patient be hyperkalemic? Probably not yet, but they might eventually. And so Rock is an appropriate choice for this patient. You could probably get away with sucks only, but there's just too many contraindications, too many things that can happen with sucks. I prefer rock uranium because of its safe profile in comparison to other paralytics. Okay. So we have intubated this patient. We've resuscitated him appropriately, properly. We use ketamine, we use rock uranium, and we successfully intubated this patient. Now, the next thing that we need to be looking at, because this is a burn patient, is looking at how much fluid we need to be giving this patient in order to properly resuscitate them. So the most commonly accepted uh, way to calculate this is using um, the four mils times weight in kilos to total body surface area. Okay, the Parkland formula, this is still the accepted 
uh, or most accepted one. Now, keep in mind is that um, we are finding that patients are over resuscitated with fluid uh, in those first eight hours using the Parkland formula, about 40% of patients are. So just be cautious. Um, typically, what we're going to use to calculate or identify proper fluid resuscitation is urine output in EMS. Unfortunately, we don't really have that opportunity. But we can certainly start fluid resuscitation and just being aware of the fact that we want to try and maintain the Parkland formula as much as we can with, as opposed to just hanging some fluid, putting a pressure diffuser on and just letting it run. That's not really what we want to do. We actually want to calculate this. Okay. And in a patient like this, just to kind of give you in perspective, four mils. So by a, um, you know, a patient that's 180 kilograms that has 20% body surface area, that's like two arms or the chest and an arm, so on and so forth. That's about, that's about 20%, 18% or so. So in those particular cases, we're looking at about 16 um, or 6,400 or 6,400 mils uh, as far as fluid goes. And remember, half of that is going to be the first eight hours. The rest of it is going to be over the next uh, 16 so that's what we're looking at for fluid resuscitation in this patient. Okay, any questions with this patient? Go ahead, put those in the comments. I would love to see some what questions you may have for this patient. You only have Rock and Beck, good. And really, you only need one of those two, right? Because Rock and Beck are both... Uh, non-polarizing agents. And so they're just different durations of time that you'll have a paralysis of paralysis. Only if pushing aggressively, would you want to do because if pushing aggressively, would, which you wouldn't want to do because of fluid overload. Yeah, the, the issue with fluid overload um, in, a, in an airway burn patient is that it can have the potential of increasing the rate of swelling. Um, and so once you capture that airway, that's, as le that's less of a concern. Uh, why would this patient become hyperkalemic? If they had a significant uh, area that's burned, when you have significant cell damage of a wide area of cells, what they do is they end up releasing their potassium uh, within the blood, which can over time create a hyperkalemic state. It's not something that we really are concerned about in an EMS setting. This takes time. Um, but um, if you are, you know, ICU care, eMERGE care, or uh, critical care transport, that would be something that you would have to take in consideration when you're intubating this patient and paralyzing them and, and also monitoring their potassium appropriately to make sure that we're not causing a hyperkalemia or using medications that could precipitate to it. So that's why they become hyperkalemic over time if there's enough cell damage because of more surface area involved. As for ketamine, given that this patient has a catecholamine release already, wouldn't ketamine make them hypotensive since ketamine would deplete them of catecholamines? Uh, that's a fantastic question. So the question is, so catecholamine or ketamine is all, is dependent on, catecholamine release. And if they are depleted of catecholamines, um, wouldn't this cause a reflex hypotension? Possibly. Okay. Um, but in an acute setting like this, they still have catecholamines, right? The, the concern with ketamine in catecholamine depletion is more brought up in sepsis when we have a patient that is septic and they've been septic for some time, those patients are severely catecholamine depleted. And so when you use ketamine in a septic patient, they tend to have a reflex hypotension because of catecholamine depletion. It doesn't, it more happens in more of a, a longer term setting as opposed to an acute setting where this patient just, uh, just had their injury. It's a fantastic question and a great thought process. And it does happen just in a more commonly in a different patient demographic. This was a airway burn. So um, either steam burns or those types of burns.
Is it better to awake intubation before RSI due to hypoxia? You could do a DSI on this patient, a delayed sequence intubation using ketamine. It's totally possible. Um, it's just not a common approach that we see in EMS. But uh, over time, I wouldn't be surprised if it did become more common. Any other questions? Do vocal cords spasm like an epiglottitis or is it swelling only from burns? They do spasm and they do swell. Yes. Would you call this into the hospital? 100% I would. Any pre-medication prior to RSI? Yes. I would say that fluids are appropriate. I would say that a presser, given the situation that we're in, would be an appropriate for this patient uh, prior to RSI and resuscitate them, their blood pressure as much as possible in order to compensate for that inevitable drop in blood pressure. Make, this sh patient's shock index was one or just below one, which isn't fat, isn't terrible, but it's not, it's not great either, right? So anything above 0 0.9 shock index has an elevated chance of, um, of post-intubation arrest, right? So this, this patient is not in a good state. Um, would be good practice to reduce induction doses and increase paralytic dose to help avoid hypotension? No, I don't think so. I think that um, keep your dosing the same from the intubation perspective and just utilize medications like pressors and fluids in order to compensate for your blood pressure. Um, I think that changing your dosing on your RSI medications is risky. And especially with using ketamine, where we have a therapeutic range that we're trying to hit, um, would probably, we want to hit that therapeutic range and we don't want to play with that dose and miss and then have a increased problem with our intubation. Great questions. Lots of complicated stuff with this guy. What would you recommend for places that don't have RSI protocols? Fantastic question. You could attempt a, um, a DSI if that's in your protocols. Uh, what else you could look at is getting a critical care transport team on as early as possible with this patient and getting them to arrive because of the things that you recognize. Um, other things that you could do is continue to resuscitate this patient using pressors, um, using fluids, using everything at your disposal. Uh, could you use an eye gel? Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to benefit this patient given the area that's burned. Um, but yeah, if you do not have RSI capabilities, your next task is getting them to a person or place that absolutely can as fast as possible. I guess that's, that would be my answer uh, because you're kind of in a position that if you end up not able to intubate this patient because you don't have RSI capabilities, um, there is a good chance that you're going to end up having to crack this patient if you, if you wait too long. What presser would I choose? Probably Levo or norepinephrine. It could, it, yeah, you could see irritation with those uh, SGA or with uh, with other airways like OPAs and MPAs for sure. Would it stop me from trying? No, but it definitely could help or it could be a problem. Well, I think that's where we're at. Hopefully you guys got a lot out of this. Thank you uh, so much for joining me today for this class. If you loved what we're doing here, uh, we have two different services. We have one that works with paramedic students and EMT students that are struggling in school and they want a better way to learn the, the, the knowledge that they need to learn. And so if you're interested in your paramedic or EMT student, join us at Master Medics, check us out. If you love what you see, you can, uh, you can stay as long as you want. If you don't like what you see, or if it's just not something that's going to work for you, you can cancel any time. You're not going to get charged within that three-day trial. But we are known for cutting study time in half and improving grades, uh, even though you're, you're not studying nearly as much, which is pretty fantastic and something we're really proud of. If you love the way that we do education from a continued education standpoint and you love these cases, we do do continued education like this. So we create interactive technology using our patient scenarios 
and creating a very engaging, very exciting type of continuing education that you actually want to use. Because what our commitment to you guys is that we use a very relevant amount of education um, for you paramedics and para for EMTs. That was really important to us. And so that is uh, our, what we want to do is create continuing education that is relevant and fun for you guys to do. So you don't, you're not, you know, scrambling and stressed out and frustrated that you're doing education that just isn't a benefit to you. So if you're interested in that, you absolutely can check us out at courses.masteryourmedics.com and you can absolutely become a member that and get continuing education credits, live ones, as well as recorded content for you too. So thanks again for joining us. Hopefully you learned something today and we will talk to you next time. Bye for now.